Hey friends, I'm Lee and welcome to A Brit Travels. Uh, if you found this video, I'd imagine it's because you're looking to book your first Orlando vacation uh, or it's been a little while. Uh, so welcome to the channel, firstly. Uh, in today's video, we're going to try and give you a pretty in-depth overview of Orlando and the theme parks as well as tips for planning your vacation to the theme park capital of the world. So grab a cup of tea and a pen and paper and we'll get cracking. Uh, could be a little bit of a long video, there's a lot to cover. So the video will be split into sections and there may be a little overlap across those sections as we're going to cover off a lot of the basics of how to get there, how to book, transport and all of the things in between. Uh, we'll start with the basics of each area but we're going to try and go pretty in depth and touch on a lot of info so stick around if this is your first time or even if you have been before, uh, a lot has changed over the last few years. Uh, the video itself is typically geared towards UK tourists when it comes to things like flights, bookings and ticket options. However, there are a few areas that could be applicable to other regions around the world. We've been to Orlando a number of times over the years, so we've seen the changes happening and we know how complicated it can get to book your vacation. Um, we wanted to just share some of our tips and some of our hints on how to do it and some best practices so you guys know what to do in the future basically. If you do find the video useful and informative, um, do give us a thumbs up so more people can see the video. It's designed to help as many people out as possible because we know how daunting it can be to book a vacation. Um, and do subscribe to the channel as well because we are heading to Orlando ourselves very soon and you guys can stick around for the series for that. Uh, we will be covering off a couple of uh, Disney parks, a couple of Universal parks. We'll be going to Bush Gardens as well. And we're staying at a number of the Disney resorts as well. So we'll have a lot to cover. We are also on all social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. So follow us there and you can see what we're getting up to as it's happening. Let's start with the basics of Orlando. Uh, so Orlando is located towards the south of the USA on what's often referred to as the Panhandle. So in Orlando and Florida, as well as the United States as a whole, they use the United States dollar as their currency. They also use those uh, two pin plug sockets uh, that are the straight plug sockets. I'll put that up on the screen now so you can see. Uh, so for the past few decades, Orlando has been seen as the theme park capital of the world. And I guess really the destination if you're heading on a holiday for a family vacation. Uh, Orlando and Florida is also five hours behind the UK in terms of the uh, time difference. The weather that you'll find here is typically pretty warm. However, there are some days where you'll get a little bit of a chill in the air. Um, over the summer period, you'll find that the weather is really, really hot. Uh, recently, it's been sometimes over 40 degrees as well. Um, but there will also be periods of very intense rain that will only last for an hour or two at a time, but it'll be very intense. Around August to late September, that is hurricane season. Uh, you may not experience anything too severe, but there are times that it can be pretty intense. You're advised to stay inside, shelter in place, things like that. It is rarer to have any of the theme parks or the shops closed down, but it has been known to happen over the past a uh, few years, so just bear that in mind when you're thinking of booking your vacation. In order to enter Florida, and actually America as a whole, you do need authorization. Uh, this is in the form of a visa or a temporary entry pass. The most common form of entry is the ESTA, and this is available to UK passport holders as well as a number of EU citizens. Now, there are certain countries in the EU that aren't able to use this program, um, for which you will need a full tourist visa to do that. Uh, the ESTA is currently, at time of recording, $21 per person, and everyone in your party has to have one. In order to actually apply for your ESTA, you will need to visit the official uh, US government website, and I will put that just here now so you can see, and it will also be in the description as well. Uh, any other website other than that link, uh, could potentially be a scam. Uh, they may not even give you an ESTA or they may still give you an ESTA but charge you more than that $21. Anything other than $21 at time of recording will be through a third party or a scam or something like that. When you are successful in applying for your ESTA, 
that will last for two years and you can come and go during that time period. You don't need to reapply, you can re-enter the US during that two year period. So if you aren't able to apply for an ESTA, as mentioned, there are some EU countries that aren't applicable to the scheme, uh, you will need to apply for a visa, and this will be a tourist visa. The one you'll need to apply for is a B-2 visa. This is the visitor's visa. It may require you to go to the US Embassy for an interview. The current fee for that is $185, according to the Embassy website. It's not something we've done recently, so that could fluctuate and change, um, but that's everything at time of recording. Uh, if you have a criminal record as well, you may not be eligible for a visa or an ESTA, um, dependent on the offence that has occurred. Uh, what we would suggest is applying for the ESTA pretty early. It's only $21 per person, and uh, make sure you've got that ESTA in place prior to booking your vacation, just in case there's any hiccups in the process. You wanna make sure you can get into the country before you're spending your hard-earned money to book that vacation. Let's start with airports in and around the Orlando area, specifically the airports that allow for international travel. You do have three main airports that British tourists will be frequenting. The main one that you'll see in the Orlando area is the Orlando International Airport. It's commonly referred to as MCO. This is the largest airport in the Orlando region. It's located around 20 minutes or so from International Drive, and it's around 40 minutes to Disney. So it does have three terminals, A, B, and C. The terminal that you arrive and depart in will depend on the airline that you're flying with. Uh, here at the Orlando International Airport, you'll typically see the likes of British Airways and Virgin. So that'll be your go-to hub. The next airport that British tourists frequent is Melbourne International Airport. It's commonly referred to as MLB, and this is located to the south of the Orlando area. It's around 1.5 hours to International Drive, and it's a little bit less to Disney in this case. You'll typically see the likes of TUI here when you're booking from the UK. The often forgotten option for flying into the Orlando region is actually Tampa International Airport. It's commonly referred to as TPA. Uh, this is located to the west of Orlando and it's around 1.5 hours from International Drive and Walt Disney World. You'll typically see the likes of British Airways and Virgin also from this airport. When it comes to airports in the UK, any of the big airports will be able to get you over to Orlando. This will, however, have a factor in the airline availability at each airport as not all airlines fly from all airports. In the London region, you'll likely be looking at either London Heathrow or London Gatwick, where you'll have the likes of British Airways, Virgin and Norse Airways. Uh, TUI, they have a little bit more of a varied approach with more regional airports serving flights on TUI's own airline. Uh, these flights can depart from London Gatwick, Bristol, Birmingham, Belfast, Manchester, Newcastle and Glasgow. So you've got a good selection uh, depending on where you want to go. Uh, Virgin Atlantic can also be found at Manchester and Edinburgh, uh, whilst British Airways depart from London Heathrow as mentioned, and they also depart from London Gatwick, so there's options that cover across all of the UK. There's a number of airlines that fly into the Orlando area. The most commonly used airlines would be British Airways, Virgin Atlantic and TUI. Uh, in recent years, there's been a little bit of a booming market in Orlando and with the reopening of international travel, there's been a few airlines that have opened up flights to the region. Uh, one of these has been Norse Atlantic Airways and they're typically pitched as a more budget friendly option. They also fly into the Orlando International Airport. Virgin Atlantic and British Airways will typically make up the lion's share of flights into the region with both airlines offering like multiple options per day, both in and out of the region. Uh, in terms of flights to Orlando, you'll typically have an early to mid afternoon flight, which will get you into Orlando either late afternoon or early evening, when you account for the time difference. On the way back to the UK, you'll typically have something in the late afternoon or early evening, which will fly you overnight, and then you'll land the next morning in London. Uh, so it's a little bit of a tiring journey, but you're not losing any time in that process. It's a, it's a good option to have. 
There are also options with the likes of Delta, United Airlines and American Airlines. They all offer similar experiences and similar booking processes as Virgin Atlantic and British Airways and they're also likely to fly into the same airports. Uh, we're not going to go into too much details on those but you can search for them yourself online. As mentioned before, when it comes to TUI, they fly into Melbourne International Airport in the south, slightly more restricted in their timings as there's less flights each day. So everything we've spoken about so far has been applicable to direct flights. There are also the option of connecting flights. A connecting flight would essentially be where you would make a stop along your journey on the way to Orlando. Uh, so this can be done in a number of ways. You can even stop in a European country along the way, somewhere like Paris, Frankfurt, Berlin, somewhere like that. And then you fly direct over into the USA. Or you can do it a different way and you fly from London to the USA and then you connect in USA, typically in somewhere like Chicago or New York or somewhere like that, and then fly down to Orlando from there. The connections for this kind of flight are typically only one connection. Uh, you'll only have one stop to make, either in that European country or over in the US. If you're not such a seasoned traveler, we would kind of shy away from doing this as your first option. Uh, direct flights are just a little bit easier to, to deal with. Uh, with a connecting flight, sometimes the airlines will move your baggage for you, other times it will require you to collect your baggage and then check back in for your flight, dependent on how you book it. So it just can be a little bit daunting to go with that. Um, either way, you'll just want to leave enough time if you do book a connecting flight to make sure that you can get from one flight to the other. You don't want any issues along the way. We're not going to get into too much more details on connecting flights because there's so many options with all different airlines the combinations could be pretty much endless at that point uh, it, we would just be here for hours doing that the majority of the airlines themselves will offer similar levels of service especially when you're flying across the pond uh, you'll have some form of meal service you're likely to have entertainment provided to you in the back seat uh, very different from back in the day where you'd have the screen right at the front of the plane or flipped down halfway and you're all watching the same film, each seat will have its own entertainment system so you can keep everybody entertained for that journey. Um, a number of the airlines will also offer you headphones to use for the journey but some may require additional purchase. Um, there are also different classes of the flights to take into account. The three main ones that we'll get into are economy, premium economy and first class. Each of these takes its own flavour once again, it just depends on the airline that you're flying with. With British Airways, you'll typically have economy, premium economy, and business class. Uh, with Virgin Atlantic, you'll have economy, premium, and upper class. They're all fairly similar. Uh, with TUI, you have the two options, that's economy and premium economy, and the same with North Atlantic Airways. Each of these options offers a slightly different experience, and personally, we've not traveled with either TUI or North, so we can't really comment on them per se, but looking at the options for TUI Premium, there are some bits and pieces that they offer in their premium flights that Virgin or British Airways would offer in their economy flights. So just bear that in mind when you're making your booking. Uh, also do be careful when you are booking flights because some airlines have now taken to separating elements of their economy class. Virgin now offer economy light, delight and classic. And sometimes this will take out the baggage and things like that, which will just add extra costs to booking your flights. And you do want to book something like Economy Classic or Economy Delight with Virgin that will offer you the baggage and then added extras from there. The actual time of the flight can be anywhere from around eight hours and upwards, dependent on the airport connections and a whole host of other factors. So you are going to be on that flight for an extended period of time. So you do want to make sure that you're picking the right airline for you, really. Uh, when searching and paying for that flight, there's a whole host of ways that you can book these, either direct with the airlines themselves or through third party booking websites or travel agents. Some of the websites that we use to check flights are Skyscanner, NetFlights and Travel Supermarket and we also look directly at the airlines on their own websites. Just be mindful when searching for flights because as less seats become available the pricing will fluctuate. It will also change the more times it's searched for and as you can imagine the time of year will also change that price as well. 
I wanted to give you an idea of our thoughts and feelings and what we generally do. Uh, I can't personally comment on Norse Airways or TUI, as we've typically flown either Virgin Atlantic or British Airways, and both of those are pretty similar. We generally prefer Virgin Atlantic as we prefer the look and feels of the plane. Uh, and Virgin also offer a good rewards scheme as well for frequent flyers. We've flown with Virgin Atlantic in all of their classes that they offer. Economy, the cheapest option, is often still pretty nice with the staff being very attentive and the food options are pretty good for plain food. In terms of the seat in economy, this is perfectly fine for us as we're not really tall people, uh, so we can work with that. Premium economy with Virgin offers a slightly bigger seat in width as well as the amount that you can recline your seat as well. And all the other areas are just generally a little bit nicer. Uh, you do also leave the plane a little bit earlier as well. Uh, upper class is a very nice experience, particularly on the Airbus aircrafts that Virgin uses. Um, they do offer you a lay flat bed, so you can rest your eyes during the process. Uh, it is significantly more expensive though. And we don't really feel that it's necessary to book that, especially on the way out, uh, because we generally want to stay awake for as long as possible on the first day uh, and make sure that we don't have any jet lag, basically. The food options in each of the classes uh, does increase in standard as you move through them. Um, premium will offer you porcelain dishes, and upper class you'll typically have food served to you as you would in a restaurant. Generally speaking, Virgin Atlantic and British Airways, you will have the option for small snacks, throughout the flight, such as pretzels, and also drinks are free throughout the flight as well. Uh, if you are flexible with your dates and times or the airport, and maybe if you're not too fussy who you're flying with, you'll have tons of options to get yourselves to Orlando. Uh, but search around and find the best option for you and whatever's uh, cheaper or whatever's the nicest option that you decide. Let's talk about how you book We've covered flights a little bit already, and you've got a number of ways to book everything as a whole. Uh, you can book with the likes of Disney or Virgin, who will both offer options for packages. These can be booked with or without flights, and can include tickets that we'll cover off a little bit later. You can also book packages with the airlines themselves. Uh, in the case with Virgin Atlantic, this would come under Virgin Holidays, and also British Airways do offer packages. You do also have travel operators in the UK who will be able to book packages for you. And this is something that TUI is particularly known for, and they'll take care of most options along the way. Although there is a chance that it will be more expensive. Another option that you can use is an independent travel agent or something similar like that. There are many out there to choose from, from big ones on the high street that you'll have will be TUI and Hayes Travel. When booking with a travel agent, you do have the option to wrap everything up into one package with your flights, your accommodation, your tickets and transports, and just wrap it in that bow. So some people do prefer to do it that way, just to have peace of mind. And you will also be at all protected there as well, which means that if anything goes wrong, you are covered under protections uh, by the travel agent. So that is also some good peace of mind to have. There is also the option to book certain elements together by using some of the above places to book accommodation and tickets, uh, and then flights separately, or flights and accommodation together and tickets separately, or you can just piecemeal everything together by booking every element separately using different sources across the web. When we personally book our vacations to Orlando, we typically book everything ourselves. Uh, we use a whole host of websites, um, some of those websites that we use are the airlines directly, like we mentioned with uh, Virgin Atlantic or British Airways, or we do search on the likes of NetFlights or Skyscanner for flights. Uh, for hotels, we sometimes use Hotels.com, depending on where we're staying, be it off-site or on-site. If you're looking to stay on-site, on property, and this is the term typically used for staying in an official Disney or Universal hotel, uh, we sometimes use the attractions websites themselves to book those hotels. For our tickets, we use the likes of attractiontickets.com as we've often found them to be the easiest and they sometimes do offer discounts like 5% off tickets. Uh, they do also offer the option to pay monthly as well. So that's a good thing to have. Attractiontickets.com do also offer you the option to book hotels through them. So you do have that option to book your hotel and your tickets in one package there. 
when you visit Orlando, it can be a big decision. And there are a few big decisions. Firstly, the main one, when do you go? The time of year can change the crowd levels drastically. And when thinking about booking your vacation, you'll want to take into account the UK school holidays, as this may be some of the busiest times at the resort. You do also want to take into account the American school holidays as well. They typically start a little bit earlier than the UK school holidays, but they also finish a little bit earlier as well. But do bear in mind, during that summer period, that may be the hottest time in Orlando. So it really just depends what you're looking for. Uh, another thing to take into account is some of the American public holidays. With the likes of spring break, the 4th of July, or the Christmas break, that can also have a huge effect on the crowd. Another thing to bear in mind would be limited seasonal offerings as this may change the crowd level throughout the year. Uh, so you'll typically see a slightly higher crowd in the Halloween season and it changes pretty drastically over the Christmas period, leading right up to Christmas and New Year due to school breaks and vacation times. That may be some of the busiest time of the year. And it has been known in the past for the parks to hit capacity couple of days over that Christmas and New Year break, so just bear that in mind. Let's talk about spending money and the best ways that you can do this. Obviously you can take cash to Orlando with you as this still is widely accepted across all of the theme parks in the Central Florida region. There may be some booths in certain theme parks that prefer card payments though, so just think about that. Uh, you do have the ability to take your existing credit or debit card over to Orlando with you and use that. Sometimes you may need to inform the bank that you are traveling just to prevent any fraudulent activity flagging up on your account. When you do take your cards over to Orlando, if you are using just your existing ones, you have to be wary that they do charge you extra. They will charge you a pretty bad exchange rate and they may also charge you a little bit of an extra fee that they put on top of the card as well. Uh, in the US, when you're using cash points as well, if you're taking cash out from that cash point, there will be a charge, much like you'll see in some of those pay point cash points over here in the UK, and it'll be a handful of dollars that they'll put on top of the fee. So if you're taking out $50, for instance, it may be $55. There are also the options for travel cards, and these are special cards that will charge you in British pounds whilst you pay in the local currency, in this case, United States dollar. There is a number of these on the market and they all have pretty similar functionality. You have the likes of Monzo, Revolu or the post office and you top these up as you go along. So that can be for good or for bad. You can uh, save up throughout the year. If you've got the post office card in January and you were to put a hundred pound on every month before your vacation, you know, you may get over a thousand or over 1500 pound on there by the end of it. And then you pay in, uh, in dollars when you get that. You also have Chase who offer fee free abroad on some of their accounts uh, and other credit card companies may not charge you any transaction fees for using your credit card abroad. Uh, they can also offer certain bonuses too when looking at these options. We personally use a company called Curve. Uh, they have a free service which doesn't require a top-up as it's connected directly to your credit or debit card. Uh, that has to be a UK issued credit or debit card. What will then happen is when you pay, every time you pay for goods in the US, your credit or debit card will be charged in British pounds, whereas then you will be paying in dollars. And that'll be a pretty favorable exchange rate as well. This can give you some pretty big savings over the rates that the banks charge you. And they also don't then have those little fees tacked on top. Uh, with Curve, you do also have the option to pay for the next level. Uh, you've got Curve Black and you've got Curve Metal at time of recording and that'll offer you additional benefits like travel insurance or gadget insurance, things like that. Um, we'll put our link down in the description. This will be a referral link where you can get £5 if you do sign up to it. It's a pretty good deal and we use it religiously actually both in the UK now and we use it abroad as well because we can track all of our transactions on our mobile phone and it goes straight to our mobile as soon as we pay. We all know nowadays that we are glued to our phones and that's the some, somewhat sad nature of the theme parks in Orlando and actually across the world now because we need to be on our phone to use maps to get around, apps to navigate the parks and all those kinds of things. 
all of the theme parks themselves will have free Wi-Fi available. Now, you may need to click a disclaimer and accept some terms and conditions, but otherwise it's a useful thing to have. Uh, this is great if you're in the parks and the resorts, but if you're looking to use your mobile phone whilst you're out and about, you may want to consider the option of roaming data. Most operators in the UK offer some form of roaming, but it can get pretty expensive. Personally, we use EE as our contract provider, and they offer us a bolt-on of £15 per month, which is very handy, and we get to use our entire allowance over in the USA. Um, I'll put over the screen now the options from the big four carriers, so you can see what those are available. If they, these are any of your carriers, then you know what you're in store for. There is also the ability to purchase a SIM card when you arrive in the USA from someone like T-Mobile, AT&T or Cricket Wireless. Uh, this can also be a little bit of an expensive option as the mobile phone plans in the USA are more expensive than here in the UK. We're quite fortunate in that sense, despite what we feel sometimes with ours being fairly expensive. Uh, there is another option as well available to you, and that is a virtual SIM card. Uh, we've used previously a company called Air Arlo on our Hong Kong trip, and they provide a virtual SIM card that can be used in various destinations around the world, and it's perfect for a couple of weeks. Uh, both of those options with the SIM card over in the USA and the virtual SIM card from somebody like Air Arlo will require you to have an unlocked phone. Um, and the Air Arlo option may not be available on some phones. If you have one that's a little bit older, uh, as you do need the ability to have an eSIM on your phone. Our next topic that we have to cover is transportation. So how to get from the airport to the parks. There's a number of options to get you from the airport, somewhat dependent on where you stay and also what we would recommend too. If you're heading to Walt Disney World on property, uh, you have the option of taking the Mears Connect and it's driven by Sunshine. Uh, this was previously the Sunshine Flyer and Mears Connect and they've merged now, so just bear that in mind. And this is a shared transportation service and it's servicing the Walt Disney World hotels and third party hotels that are located on Disney property. Uh, there's a list of hotels that it serves on screen now. You can use either the standard service, which is $39.90 per adult, or $28.35 per child for a round trip. They do also have the express service, which is $250 per trip for up to four people, and then each additional person is $55. There was previously a service called Magical Express, which is no longer applicable if you took that previously. To get to Universal, they have their own shuttle service called Universal's Superstar Shuttle. This service serves all Universal and Lowe's operated hotels on Universal property. The hotels that are served are on screen now. The pricing of the Superstar Shuttle is $39 per adult, and $29 per child for a round trip. And it's slightly less if you were to just choose a one-way service. There may also be options that are arranged by your tour operator if you've booked with somebody like Virgin Holidays, British Airways, or a travel agent. They may utilize one of those previously mentioned services and they'll bundle it into the cost of your package and just give you a voucher to say that you've got that service essentially. Um, or they may arrange something else for you. Another option that is quite popular nowadays are ride-sharing apps. The likes of Uber or a popular one in the USA is Lyft. Now, ride-shares like this can be used to and from the airport, but can also be used in and around the local area as well. Uh, but the costs can start to add up, so just bear that in mind. Uh, you can download both of these apps whilst you're in the UK and set them up here, connecting your credit or debit card, or one of those travel cards that we mentioned previously. Typically with these you will see a standard size car, however there are options for bigger vehicles if there are more passengers. But just remember on the standard size cars there are only four seats available because the fifth one's taken up by a driver and you also want to take into account baggage as well. When you're in the USA and you're renting one of these ride share services, you will want to bear in mind the Florida car seat laws if you're traveling with children. And these are posted on screen now. And there are no exceptions to these laws outside of the ages. So if your child is or will be in the age range, then all of the relevant seats and boosters will be required. Another option that is available and is often quite popular in Orlando and Florida as a whole, and this is car hire. 
And this is the option that we typically choose each time just for ease of use to travel where we want, when we want, uh, without having to wait. Though I do understand the anxiety of driving in a different country, it can be a little bit daunting. There's a ton of options available for car hire with a number of the big companies directly in the, in the airport. In the case of Orlando International, you'll have the likes of Enterprise, Avis and Alamo, as well as a number of others. There are also smaller companies that operate off-site, so you will need to get a shuttle bus to get there. There are various ways to book your car hire, and this can be done directly with your preferred company on their website. It can be through your tour operator during the booking process of your vacation, or you can add it on later with them. Um, but there are also search options which will pull all of these results from across the web, uh, the likes of Kayak or Travel Supermarket. Our go-to website is Argus Car Hire. Uh, we found them to be the cheapest on most occasions actually, but we have also used Costco Travel as Costco car holders, although they do have slightly less options available. So we wanted to give some tips for hiring a car in Florida. So all cars that you hire will be automatic, so you don't have to worry about gears or having the gear stick in a different place. It's just not there, really. Uh, in the USA, they drive on the right side of the road, so you are on the opposite side. The lanes and the roads in general are often a lot bigger, uh, and it's relatively easy to get used to this as soon as you're driving. At certain junctions, but you need to watch out for signs that say you can't, um, at certain junctions, you can turn right on a red light as well. If you don't do this, someone may beep you from behind anyway, so just bear that in mind. There are very few roundabouts in the USA, uh, so this isn't really something that's necessary to worry about. Um, they have more crossroads than anything. Uh, this is where everybody takes turns to go, uh, and also toll roads are a pretty big thing in Florida. They can be avoided by setting your navigation to avoid them. They are relatively cheap, but most of them only accept cash uh, or the toll pass. Um, and that'll generally be coins or the toll pass, as we mentioned. For the toll pass, you can rent one from your car hire company, but it is normally fairly overpriced, though it does give you peace of mind. At the Orlando International Airport, and only at the Orlando International Airport, you can get something called the Visitor Toll Pass. Now, this is a free of charge pass that you hang on your rear view mirror. And what this will allow is you to go through those automatic toll booths and they'll charge you directly onto the card attached to the account. Now this is the easiest way we found to navigate the toll roads, but as mentioned, it is only found at Orlando International Airport. And there's no word currently on whether this will be expanded, uh, but just visit their website to see whether that changes. Another form of transport that you can make use of, and it's not something that we've necessarily done before, um, but it is handy if you're staying around the International Drive or Universal Boulevard area, and that's the iRide trolley. And this is a cute looking bus service which runs up and down iDrive between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. and it serves the likes of Fun Spot America, SeaWorld, Aquatica, and Icon Park. Now, a single fare is $2 per adult and it's $1 per child. You can also purchase passes that can last anywhere between one day and 14 days. And that will give you options to use those service for that length of time. We will cover off transportation on site in just a second. Now we've got the basics out of the way, let's look at where you can stay. Because uh, this can often be a pretty big choice for you. Now, talking about big choices, firstly, you've got two big choices, which then turn into smaller ones from there. And the first big choice is whether you're gonna stay on-site or off-site. And what do we typically mean by this? On-site basically means staying in a Disney-owned hotel or a Universal hotel. Now, there's a number of options for each site that we'll go into in just a second, but you've also got then the option of off-site. And this is typically the term that refers to everything else. Uh, with hotels off-site that are not on Disney or Universal property, villas or apartments or something like that basically. The size of the group going on vacation is likely to pay a pretty big factor into which of the options you choose. As you can imagine, smaller groups may find hotels 
either on-site or off-site cheaper. Whereas some larger groups may find that it's cheaper to look into a villa or something similar like that. There is no one size fits all option here, but this is often the biggest choice of your vacation planning outside of the dates that you go. Walt Disney World has a lot of options to choose from when it comes to hotels. And these are typically split into three categories. You've got value, moderate, and deluxe. And as the name suggests, the quality, amenities, and the likes increases as you move through those categories, but so does the price. Uh, so take a look on screen now to see which hotel fits into which category. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail on each hotel, as there's so many of them to choose from, but they each have their own theme. Some of them are self-explanatory in the name. Uh, this also means that sometimes they have food offerings at the hotel related to the theme of the hotel itself, such as the Polynesian Resort having Hawaiian-inspired menus at some of their restaurants. A lot of the time, the category a hotel is featured in is also determined by the transportation options available or the proximity to the parks. As you saw with the likes of the Contemporary, the Polynesian, and the Grand Floridian are all deluxe resorts. Now, they're located on the lagoon that is connected to the main theme park, the Magic Kingdom. They have a monorail service directly at the hotel to go to the park, as well as connections to Epcot. Now, these hotels are also within walking distance of the Magic Kingdom too, so that will play a huge factor in the price. Each hotel at Walt Disney World has transportation links to all parks. Now this can be via the monorail as mentioned for those particular deluxe resorts. However, all hotels do offer bus services and some have the ability to walk to one or two parks. A few of these hotels also have one of the newest modes of transport, the Disney Skyliner. And this is a suspended gondola service which links Art of Animation and Pop Century to Hollywood Studios and Epcot. But it also links to Caribbean Beach Resort and the Riviera. Uh, all changes are made at the Caribbean Beach Resort, as this is the main Skyliner hub. And some resorts also have the option of boat service to certain parks as well. Recently, Walt Disney World has made changes to their hotel parking policy for hotel guests. Now, if you are a guest at the hotel, you no longer have to pay for overnight parking. If you're staying at a Disney hotel, you also get parking at the theme park too. So that may be something that you want to factor in when you look at where to stay, as parking in the theme parks is $25 per day. So if you are going for an extended period of time, that can really add up. In terms of the on-site transportation too, you also have the option of a minivan. Uh, this is essentially a Lyft rideshare, uh, and it's booked via the Lyft app. However, all drivers are Walt Disney World cast members, and the cars can look pretty cute too. And they should be equipped with car seats, chargers, and other nice to have features, but they can be quite expensive. So we generally say use them sparingly if cost is a factor when you're deciding things. Personally, at the time of recording, we've only stayed at the Caribbean Beach Resort. So it's difficult for us to make any real recommendations on where you should stay. On our upcoming trip though, we are booked to stay at All Star Movies and also at Coronado Springs. So do stick around and subscribe because we will have videos up from both of those resorts with our thoughts and feelings after the fact on whether we liked those resorts or not. If you're staying in a Disney World hotel, you are able to book dining reservations up to 60 days before your vacation for a 10 day period in total. Once you hit 70 days in total, it will open up each day thereafter. The time to book reservations is 6 a.m. Orlando time, and that is generally 11 a.m. in the UK. Another perk that you would have staying on site as well is early park entry. Now, that isn't a lot of time, but you generally get around 30 minutes in each of the parks before normal day guests are allowed in. So that is another perk to consider when booking your vacation. Universal Orlando also has a number of hotel options available and these are split into four categories. This time with value, prime value, preferred and premier resorts. Much in the same way as Disney, the quality increases as the level goes up, as does the price. Now take a look on screen now to see which hotel fits into which category. As with Disney, we won't go into too much detail on each hotel individually. However, we will note a few points. 
None of the Universal Orlando hotels are operated by Universal directly. They're operated by the Lowe's hotel chain. Now this isn't necessarily a detriment to the hotel as it can be seen as a benefit in some instances as Lowe's is a pretty established hotel operator. Much like the Disney hotels, you will have transport options available. Uh, the preferred and premier resorts will offer you the quickest route to the parks as they'll often have a walking route. They may also have a water taxi service available. Uh, though These are typically low capacity, but they do come fairly frequently. Cabana Bay and Aventura have a walking path directly to Volcano Bay as well. The newest resort at Universal Orlando is the Endless Summer Resort. Now this is their most budget friendly option. It is located a little further away from the parks and there is no designated walking path, but they do offer bus services. It can be a little bit trickier to get to the parks in that case, but the bus services come pretty frequently. With this being the most budget friendly option available, they also do have some suites available at really good prices. So you can get a two bedroom suite for an amazing price and house some of those larger groups. Now one of the perks for staying in a premier hotel at Universal Orlando is the free express pass that each guest gets for the length of their stay. And that includes check-in and check-out day. So if you only have a couple of days at Universal, uh, this is normally a pretty amazing perk as it can cost a lot for everyone to get a pass and it saves so much in QN. Another perk that you have with the Universal Hotels and staying on site with Universal Hotel is that early park entry. Now that is typically around an hour or so before day guests can get into the park. You do want to be there right at the front of the queue though if you are going to utilize that early park entry as some of the more popular rides fill up pretty quickly and you can still get quite a wait for them with the likes of Hagrid's and Velocicoaster posting some of the largest waits across the resort. At the time of recording we have no experience staying at a Universal Hotel so we can't really recommend any of them or give feedback but as mentioned with the Disney Hotels do stick around because we are staying at Cabana Bay and we are also staying at the Endless Summer Resort in our upcoming vacation so we'll have a few videos up on those offering our thoughts and feedback from that stay. There is also options of staying off-site, and now this typically means staying somewhere not on Disney or Universal property. Uh, for those, there are a number of options. You'll have hotels dotted all around the central Florida region, with areas close to Kissimmee being very popular, as this is close to Walt Disney World, or you may have the area like International Drive, which is a stone's throw from Universal Orlando Resort. Wherever you stay around the area, you're normally only around 30 minutes from either of these destinations. In order to book hotels, uh, we often like to check the likes of Hotels.com, Booking.com and Expedia. These tend to offer most protections and best prices as well. Another option you have is to rent an apartment or a villa. Now this is a popular option with bigger groups, but it can also be a great option for smaller parties too that may want a little bit more freedom. You'll find these options dotted all over the place. Many will be in the previously mentioned Kissimmee region uh, or Davenport. And due to zoning regulations in the area, certain areas just aren't allowed to be used for short-term rentals. So you'll often see communities that are clustered together. Typically not up by Universal Orlando Resort, although there are a few of them up there. A lot of the villas you'll find will have private pools of sorts, but this won't necessarily be heated unless you paid for it extra in the majority of cases. For smaller groups, you may want to look at an apartment rather than a villa. They may be slightly smaller and may not have a private pool, but there may be a shared pool in the community, so it really is up to you. In order to book an apartment or a villa, you can use websites like verbo.com or airbnb.com. These will typically have tons of rentals in the Orlando region to choose from. When looking for a place to stay on one of these websites, just be cautious that there may be additional fees for cleaning and such, which may not display until you go through the checkout process. One tip that we've got is you can also check the account that is hosting that rental. Uh, some of those accounts will have direct websites, which may be a little bit cheaper if you're comfortable stepping outside the additional protections that Verbo and Airbnb may offer. The typical hotel websites may also offer a handful of these types of accommodations too, so be sure to check them out. 
Many of the above options will also be bookable through travel agents or tour operators like Virgin Holidays, British Airways or TUI. And like we mentioned previously, they may come with additional protections like the atoll protection, although some places may not actually tell you the villa or apartment that you're staying in until the last minute. So just bear that in mind if you're somebody that wants to have all information to hand before you go on your vacation. Let's get to the important stuff, the theme parks. We're going to briefly cover each theme park as well as the water parks and mention some of the top rides and what they're like so you can kind of get a sense for things. First up, we have the original park at Walt Disney World, the Magic Kingdom. This is the park you have to visit on your Disney vacation, the flagship Disney park. Now here you'll find the likes of Space Mountain, It's a Small World and Haunted Mansion. But you also find the newly opened ride, Tron Light Cycle Run. Now this is the newest ride at Walt Disney World at the time of recording. This is a high speed roller coaster where you enter the grid to compete against the orange team. And you do get some pretty spectacular views over here as well. The previously mentioned rides I want to touch on a little bit. Space Mountain, and this is an indoor roller coaster in, in the dark, uh, set to a space theme as the name suggests. It's a small world, and that's a slower moving boat ride, taking you through world themed scenes to the classic Disney song. You can hear it in your head now, right? A haunted Mansion is a slow moving dark ride where you're taken through a spooky house encountering ghosts and ghouls along the way. You may have seen that in the newest Disney film, The Haunted Mansion. You'll see some little Easter eggs along the way through that. Now, Magic Kingdom is the park where you'll find the iconic Cinderella Castle. It's also the most family orientated park too. You'll have something here for the entire family, including the princess meet and greets and the Festival of Fantasy Parade, which features tons of characters. Nightly, you'll also have the widely acclaimed Happily Ever After fireworks, which will display in the night sky, so be sure to watch this at least once on your vacation. If you do want to get a good spot, you will need to get there early, as space typically fills up in the hub as well as down Main Street. The next park that we have is Epcot. Now, this was the second park to open at Walt Disney World. This is the Discovery Park. It has less intellectual property rides than the other parks, though there are rides for children. This typically skews for a slightly older audience. Now, as you enter the park, you have the icon, Spaceship Earth. And the park is split into two main sections. You have the main park, and then you also have the World Showcase. Now the main park is where you'll typically find the majority of rides, and World Showcase is where you'll find areas designed to look like countries from around the world. You'll have the likes of Japan, Mexico and France. Now there are a couple of rides in this area, but it's primarily for exploring these countries. And there are often food options dotted all over World Showcase where you'll find little food booths offering you paid taster sized portions of food items. In the main area of the park, you'll find the majority of rides. You have the likes of Soarin' Around the World, which is a flying theatre attraction, where you're transported around the world with a bird's eye view of some of the most iconic areas. You'll also have the previously mentioned Spaceship Earth. Now, as mentioned, this is the icon of the park, the golf ball of sorts, but you do have a ride inside it as well. Now, it's a slow moving dark ride, which explores communication through the ages. It's also narrated by Judy Dench. In Epcot, you also have one of the newest rides at Walt Disney World, and this is Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. That's a high-speed roller coaster to some classic popular music. We have to save the world with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, this is a must-do whilst you're at Walt Disney World, um, but it can be slightly motion sickness inducing, so just bear that in mind if you are prone to motion sickness. On the World Showcase Lagoon, every night you have a nighttime show. Now the current one is Epcot Forever. This is a fireworks show that includes lasers and lights on the lagoon as well as lights around the park. Now at time of recording uh, Disney have announced that they're going to change this show but they haven't said when so this may have changed by the time you watch this video. Uh, also, right at the end of the night, you do have a light and music show that is performed on Spaceship Earth too. So be sure to check both options as really these are included in your ticket price. The third park we have at Walt Disney World is Disney's Hollywood Studios. This is the movie park. 
and you're transported into the golden age of Hollywood as you walk down Hollywood Boulevard towards the iconic Chinese theatre. Now this park has classic attractions like the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror where you step into the Twilight Zone and ride an elevator where things are bound to go wrong. This isn't for the faint-hearted though. In this park you will also have Toy Story Land. Now this is a land that is completely dedicated to the beloved Pixar film series. Here you have free rides including Slinky Dog Dash which is kind of a children's roller coaster of sorts with some great theming. And in Hollywood Studios you will also find Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. As you enter you're transported to the planet of Batu. Here you have the chance to pilot the Millennium Falcon with Chewbacca in Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run or escape capture by the First Order in Star Wars Rise of the Resistance. Now, Rise of the Resistance is a revolutionary dark ride. It's really long and well worth the queue that it can command. You move around the First Order ship, encountering many bad obstacles along the way, and we 100% recommend doing this ride if you are at Hollywood Studios. Also at Hollywood Studios, Almost nightly, you have the Phantasmic Nighttime Spectacular. Now this is located in a theater just off of Sunset Boulevard by the Tower of Terror. This is a hugely over the top nighttime show featuring a huge amount of characters, special projections and fireworks to top it off. And it's a great way to end the day. Despite it being a huge capacity, the theater does fill up pretty quickly. And it is also outside, so if it rains, you may get a little bit wet. The final theme park at Walt Disney World is Disney's Animal Kingdom. This is the zoo park, let's say. It features loads of animals from all across the natural world. The icon as you walk into the park is the Tree of Life. It's a huge tree that has intricate carvings in the trunk. So go and see which animals that you can spot as you walk close by it. The park also includes some pretty amazing rides. You have the likes of Expedition Everest, which is a roller coaster that will take you right up Mount Everest. We may encounter a Yeti along the way that's causing a little bit of mayhem. You also have the beloved Kilimanjaro Safari. Much like the name suggests, this is a ride around Safari where you're sure to spot a ton of animals, maybe even some lions and tigers. This is best done either early in the morning or just before sundown as it's a little bit cooler around these times and you're more likely to spot more animals. It's a very long ride and it's so well crafted. We love doing this ride every time that we go. The go-to area at Animal Kingdom for a lot of guests is Pandora, the world of Avatar. Here you're transported to the planet of Pandora where you'll see the floating mountains high above you. and you really do see floating mountains high above you. It is incredible. The headline attraction here is Flight of Passage, where you're paired with an avatar, and then you get to fly on the back of a banshee as you soar over Pandora. Now, this is a world-class ride once again, and if you get the chance, we really do recommend doing it because there is nothing like it anywhere in the world. At Animal Kingdom, there is no out-and-out -out nighttime show because of the animals. They don't have fireworks, they can't set them off. Um, but over the autumn and winter months, when the sun sets a little bit earlier, you have something called Tree of Life Awakenings, where the Tree of Life comes to life, really. Uh, with projection mapping on the tree itself, you can sit and watch that. It's typically only a few minutes at a time and there's a few different versions of it but it is a good watch that we do recommend if you are in the parks at that time. Along with the theme parks at Walt Disney World you also have two water parks each with a separate theme. The two water parks that you have are Typhoon Lagoon and Blizzard Beach. Now Typhoon Lagoon as the name suggests is themed as if a typhoon has ravaged the area and caused havoc. The second water park is Blizzard Beach, and this has a more kind of cutesy feel with uh, snow covered peaks and skiing themes throughout. And there's also a small frozen themed area. Both water parks have something for all ages with children's splash pads or family, family raft rides, as well as some singular solo slides that hit that thrill factor a little bit more. In more recent times though, Disney have taken to only open one of these water parks at a time. So you do want to check on which one is open at the time of your vacation, uh, as this may play a little bit of a factor into when you decide to go. If you've previously been to Walt Disney World, you're likely to remember Fastpass or Fastpass Plus. This is gone. 
it is completely gone. The replacement service is called Genie Plus. It can get a little bit more complicated, so I'll try and explain it as best I can. There are three elements to the Genie service. The first is Genie. Now this is essentially an automated free of charge planning tool. You input the types of things that you're into, like princesses or thrill rides, and the Genie service will attempt to come up with some kind of itinerary for your day. It can be a little bit hit and miss from what I've seen, but it can also give you a kind of a good idea of what to do. Next up, you have Genie Plus. Now this is a paid for service and the price of it varies per day, but it also varies per park you can choose. You can buy one park or you can buy multiple parks. So it does really depend on what your plans are for that day as to which option that you choose when you buy. Uh, if one park does sell out, it does mean that you're no longer able to buy that multi-park option. So just bear that in mind. Genie Plus works kind of like a virtual queuing system. You can select an attraction that you'd like to experience and you're given a return time for that attraction. Once you select your first attraction, you can then select another attraction once you've either checked into that first one or two hours later, whichever comes first. If you're smart about it, you can really knock off quite a few attractions using Genie Plus. It can be purchased from midnight on the day of your park visit and you can make your first ride selection at 7am. The two hours for the next selection starts after the park has opened, as the park opens. When you redeem your ride, you'll want to head to the lightning lane where you can scan in and bypass the majority of the standby queue. You've also got individual lightning lanes. Now this is a paid for per ride service where you're essentially paying to skip the queue. Now this is only applicable really for a handful of attractions, mainly the big ticket rides in each park. Now at time of recording, this is the following ones that are on screen. These are not included as selections in the Genie Plus service. They can be purchased from 7 a.m. if you're staying in a Disney hotel or other select hotels. Otherwise, they can be purchased when the park opens. Another thing to consider when it comes to rides is the virtual queue. Now, this is a service which allows you to book your spot on the ride. At time of recording, this is only applicable to two rides at Walt Disney World, Tron, Light Cycle Run, and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. If you don't want to pay for the individual lightning lanes, the virtual queue is currently the only way to experience these rides as there is no standby queue. You'll have two opportunities typically to book into the virtual queue. The first one is at 7am where you can book from anywhere to do this. You'll select your party and then book into your rides. We would suggest selecting your party just slightly before 7am. Then when 7am comes, you do need to be quick as this can really go pretty quickly. There is another slot available to book at 1pm. Now this is for guests in the park. These tend not to go as quickly as the 7am ones as it's not quite a three for all like it would be in the morning. When you book in, it'll give you a boarding group number and a countdown time when to return to the ride. You've got to keep an eye on this as this can change pretty rapidly dependent on how the operations are on the ride that day. And it's not entirely accurate, so just really do keep an eye on it. There is a third time that you can book in, but this is only applicable to guests staying in deluxe resorts on certain days. Now this will be at 6 p.m. in the park. And as mentioned, the rest of the rules apply, like we said before. At Walt Disney World, you have a very inclusive resort. Now, Disney World operates a service called the Disability Access Pass, or DAS for short. This service promotes accommodations for people with disabilities, both visible and invisible. Now, in order to book onto the service, you'll need to have an interview with a Disney World cast member. You can do this beforehand through the Disney World website, although you do need a VPN for this, or you can wait until you get to the resort and visit one of the guest experience desks. It's very quick to do, and they'll ask you a few questions about your accommodations that you need to go on your vacation. Once you've had those questions answered and you are enrolled in the service, you have access to the Disability Access Service, where you can use the My Disney Experience app to book yourself a return time for the rides, in similar fashion to Genie Plus. 
You will be waiting the full time posted on the standby entrance, however. You'll do this virtually. Sometimes physical disabilities do not qualify for the service, such as broken legs and arms and things like that, as you'll still be able to use a wheelchair in all of the ride queues as they accommodate for them in most cases. Walt Disney World do also have the ability to hire wheelchairs and electric convenience vehicles too. This can be done at the entrance to all of the parks. And you do also have the ability to hire one from a third party company in the Orlando area. So currently in the works at Walt Disney World, you have a couple of projects due to open over the next year or so. Firstly, you have Journey of Water inspired by Moana. This is a walkthrough interactive exhibit in Epcot where you can interact with water and there are details referencing Moana throughout the attraction. Now this is due to open in late 2023. It may already be open when you watch this video. You also have the reimagining of Splash Mountain, the classic log flume attraction at the Magic Kingdom. This is being rethemed to Tiana's Bayou Adventure. The basic ride will stay the same in that it will be an approximately 10 minute long well-themed log flume attraction. However, this will now be themed after The Princess and the Frog with a new story. Now, this is due to open in 2024. There's not necessarily been any additional enhancements to the resort announced after 2024, though this could change by the time you watch this video. At Walt Disney World, you have a number of seasonal events dependent on the time of year. The obvious ones being Halloween and Christmas. For Halloween, the main attractions are Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. This is a separately ticketed event which runs at the Magic Kingdom from mid-August to Halloween. If you don't have a ticket to this, you can't stay in the Magic Kingdom once the party starts properly. All ticket holders have a wristband that you'll have to show throughout the course of the evening. So they know who's who, you will go out of the park. The event lasts from 7pm to midnight and features a special parade, a stage show and a firework display. You also have limited edition characters, special ride overlays and lots of trick or treat candy trails. Uh, the park is decorated for the season and you'll have specialty food treats available during this time as well. You will have special food options all over Walt Disney World for the Halloween season. For Christmas, the whole resort gets decorated with Christmas trees and decorations everywhere, including gingerbread creations. You have special tree hunts at Disney Spring Shopping Village and special food across the entire resort. You'll also have two parties taking place from mid-November to Christmas. The first one of these is Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party, taking place at the Magic Kingdom. As with the Halloween event, if you don't have a ticket, you won't be able to stay in the park. Here you have the same kind of things, a special parade, stage show and fireworks. You also have a cookie stroll around the park and hot chocolate too, as well as special characters to meet and greet. New for 2023, and there's no word on whether it will return for 2024, is Disney Jollywood Nights. Now this takes place at Disney's Hollywood Studios on select nights again. The same ticketing rules apply. Again, you'll have a special fireworks show on the Chinese theater, Jingle Bell, Jingle Bell. Uh, you also have a stage show presented by the Muppets and once again, special character greetings. At Epcot, you'll have events throughout the year which can change the dynamic of the park. Now these events happen in normal hours and they don't require an additional ticket. You'll have the Festival of the Arts in the first couple of months of the year. You'll have loads of artists showing off their work as well as cool food items to try. You have Flower and Garden Festival in the spring to summertime where you have food booths and topiaries all over the park. In the late summer to autumn, you'll have the Food and Wine Festival. This, as the name suggests, focuses on the food with loads of food booths all over the park themed to different countries. And then in the winter, you'll have the Festival of the Holidays where they decorate the park for the Christmas season and countries offer their different interpretations of the holidays through character interactions and talks with certain people. There are a few more bits and pieces to Walt Disney World. And this place is basically a huge city. The biggest one that comes to mind for us when we look at a Disney vacation is Disney Springs. Now, this is the shopping district to the south of the property. Here at Disney Springs, you'll have tons of shops and restaurants. You'll also have a few attractions and other things to do. 
Entrance to Disney Springs is free, as well as the parking there being free, but obviously the shops, restaurants, and attractions aren't. A couple of the restaurants that we like to recommend are Chicken Guy, which is a typical uh, chicken and chips restaurant, but they have over 20 sauces to choose from. It's pretty cheap, but we think it's pretty good food. We love it. Another place is Polite Pig. Now this is a quick service barbecue joint. Also relatively cheap, but it's packed with a lot of flavor. We do also recommend a stop by Gideon's Bakehouse, if you can, to get a couple of their insanely good cookies. There can be a very big queue for this place sometimes though. At Disney Springs, you, you will find the world of Disney. This is the huge Disney store at Walt Disney World where you can get all of your merchandise. On Disney property, you also have a couple of miniature golf courses too, Fantasia Garden and Winter Summerland. Each of these has two routes of 18 holes and they're priced at $14 per adult and $12 per child. It's a great way to spend a non-park day. Uh, you do also have full-size golf courses too on site if you're that way inclined. Parking at the Walt Disney World theme parks is currently $25 per car per day at time of recording. Once you have paid, that ticket is valid for the entire day at all of the Disney World theme parks. The water parks are free of charge for parking. If you're staying at a Walt Disney World hotel, the parking at the theme parks is is free for the length of your stay. As mentioned previously, Disney Springs parking is free, but you can't park here and go to the theme parks. It's just not really an option. If you have a dining reservation at one of the hotels, you're able to enter the hotel car park free of charge for a couple of hours. Now, obviously tickets are essential to Walt Disney World. In the UK and Ireland, we're very fortunate to have a special deal on our tickets compared to our friends over in the USA. You must buy your tickets beforehand in the UK before you leave on your vacation to take advantage of this offer. Uh, if you do plan on going to the parks for more than a few days, this is probably your best option as the prices work out far cheaper. Now, currently at time of recording, tickets are anywhere between £550 or £600, depending on the dates that you choose in 2024. The pricing may fluctuate slightly or so as deals become available. This particular ticket is valid for 14 days of park entry over the course of an 18 day period, starting on the date that you select. The ticket includes entry to all Walt Disney World theme parks and water parks and allows you to visit different parks on the same day after 2 p.m. You also have access to the Disney Memory Maker service. This means you'll get all of your photos included, including the ones on the ride, as well as photographers that are located all around the park. Another benefit is access to the previously mentioned golf courses for one round per day per ticketed person before 4 p.m. This is a great value ticket as Day tickets to Walt Disney World can sometimes be over $100 and the ability to hop between parks on the same day is normally an added cost. You also normally have to pay extra for the Memory Maker Photography Service in USA which is $199 for the length of your stay so you really can save a lot of money with this ticket. When we book tickets our go-to website is attractiontickets.com. You can see this on the screen now and we found them very good and occasionally there's a deal for 5 to 10% off ticket costs. They also allow you to pay in installments for tickets too. Other websites are available like floridatix.com or even directly with Disney at disneyworld.co.uk. If you book packages you can add tickets to your package at the going rate for the time with any operator that you may use. The other major theme park resort in the Orlando area is Universal Orlando Resort. Located slightly more north of Orlando International Airport and close to International Drive, Universal Orlando Resort is comprised of two theme parks and one water park, although Universal Orlando refers to this as a water theme park. The original theme park at Universal Orlando Resort is Universal Studios Florida. This historically was more of a movie theme park where you'd have rides dedicated to certain movies or movie making. Whilst this has changed slightly over the years, you'll still have hints of it with some of the shows on offer throughout the resort, like the horror makeup show or animal actors on location. 
This park has some really great rides with the classic opening day attraction, E.T. Adventure, which is a slow moving dark ride where you have to get E.T. back to his home planet, riding a bike to get there. But don't worry, you don't have to pedal. That's done for you. Another great ride here is Revenge of the Mummy, which is an indoor roller coaster themed to the Mummy series from the late 90s and early 2000s, starring Brendan Fraser, who we all love, right? Finally, the headline area of Universal Studios Florida is the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Diagon Alley. Now, this is a very faithful recreation of the iconic area from the Harry Potter film series. This area has one attraction, and that's Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts, which is kind of a hybrid roller coaster, dark ride, where you journey inside the Gringotts vaults and come face to face with some of the bad characters from the series, like he who must not be named. The newest ride at Universal Studios Florida and the newest ride at Universal Orlando Resort as a whole is VillainCon Minion Blast. Based on the Minions franchise, this is a slow moving interactive blaster ride where your job is to rack up as many points as you can using your blaster. Now it's suitable for all ages according to Universal as long as you can stand and this is on a moving walkway conveyor belt. So just make sure you can stand and you can ride the ride. Although I do hear that the blasters can be a little heavy. The second theme park you have here at Universal Orlando Resort is Universal Islands of Adventure. This is quite a bit bigger than Studios Park and is separated into distinct lands. In this park you'll find the likes of Marvel Superhero Island, Toon Lagoon, Jurassic Park and Zeus Landing. Think of Dr. Zeus, Cat in the Hat, Grinch, things like that. Here you also have another Wizarding World and that is the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Hogsmeade Village. This is where you'll find the iconic Hogwarts Castle. Hogsmeade Village features three attractions, Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, which is a sm slow moving simulator taking you around the Hogwarts Castle and the grounds. You'll also have Flight of the Hippogriff, which is a small family roller coaster. Now you do also have the somewhat recently added Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. This is a high speed roller coaster taking you around the Hogwarts grounds on Hagrid's motorbike themselves encountering loads of creatures along the way. In the Wisdom World, you also have the Hogwarts Express. Now this is the iconic train that you can ride and be transported between the Wisdom World here and the Wisdom World at Studios Park, going from Hogsmeade to London King's Cross. This does require park to park ticket to experience. At Islands of Adventure, you also have the recently added Velocicoaster, which is once again a high speed roller coaster taking you over the island's lagoon and through a velociraptor paddock as well so you want to be quick and not get caught by those velociraptors. Both of the Universal theme parks are typically geared towards a slightly older more thrill-seeking demographic than Disney although there are rides for less thrill inclined and small children with the Minion area at Studios Park and also Zeus Land in, in Islands of Adventures there are a few smaller rides for smaller children. At Universal Orlando Resort, you do also have Universal Volcano Bay. This is what Universal has dubbed a water theme park, featuring an amazing volcano, Krakatawa, towering over the park and acting as a kind of centerpiece. You have beaches and lounges located all around the park, as well as tons of slides. You also have a lazy river and a fast moving river too, and even a water roller coaster. This park is a lot of fun and one that we don't think you should miss, even if just for scenic elements. If you are a top thrill seeker, you can even venture to the very top of the volcano and take on one of the plunge slides where the floor will literally drop out from underneath you and you come shooting down. If you're not such a thrill seeker, at the bottom of the volcano you do have the beach and a wave pool and you can also explore the volcano too which has many interactive elements both inside the volcano and around the park, it's very cool. Universal, somewhat like Disney, have a shopping district although this is a lot smaller than Disney Springs. You'll have Universal City Walk. This is where you'll need to walk through and what links the parks if you are parking in Universal's parking garage. 
Here at City Walk, you have a number of dining locations, including the Hard Rock Cafe, which is the biggest in the world. You also have Tusum's Chocolate Emporium, a chocolate-themed steampunk vibe restaurant, as well as tons more restaurants. Now, if you fancy something sweet, we recommend heading to Voodoo Donuts as well. This is a really well-themed donut shop with tons of options that are really cute. At City Walk, you also have a sports bar, a cinema, a two course mini golf section and two escape rooms, one themed to Jurassic World and the other themed to Back to the Future. So needless to say, there's quite a bit to do in such a small area. Universal Orlando Resort, much like Disney, is always expanding. Now currently Universal is doing this at a much quicker and much bigger rate than Disney. Having recently opened VillainCon Minion Blast in the new Minion Land, Universal is fast at work adding an additional children's focused area to Studios Park. Recently they closed what they dubbed Kids Zone. Now this is being re-themed and set to open in 2024 and the new area will be themed to DreamWorks animation so you'll likely have the likes of Shrek and Trolls in the area and hopefully this new area will be very good for smaller children typically geared directly towards them. Also coming up in 2025 Universal are opening a whole new theme park. They're calling this Universal Epic Universe. This is located about two miles from the main Universal Orlando campus. The new theme park is currently rumoured to feature four distinct lands as well as a central hub that will have a few additional attractions. Although very little has been announced for this theme park at time of recording, the theme park is rumoured to feature lands based on How to Train Your Dragon, Universal Monsters, Harry Potter and primarily Fantastic Beasts, although the ride is rumoured to be more geared towards Harry Potter, and finally what could be considered the headline land at Epic Universe, Super Nintendo World. This is rumoured to feature free rides, a Mario Kart themed interactive dark ride, a slow moving Yoshi ride, and a unique Donkey Kong roller coaster. If any of this at all sounds like something you're interested in, keep an eye on announcements as it's scheduled to open in summer 2025. Although, as mentioned, not a lot has been announced really, and all of this is subject to change as well. At Universal Orlando Resort, you have a number of events celebrating different holidays throughout the year. Starting in the spring season, you have Mardi Gras. Now, Universal Studios comes alive with the New Orleans vibes, with tons of food and drink. You will also have a Mardi Gras parade, which travels around the park. Now, this is a free event, so you don't require an additional ticket. You just need to be in the park to see the happenings. For Halloween, which is... September through October on select nights, you'll have Halloween Horror Nights. This is a separately ticketed event and it's been going on for over 30 years at this point. This is the premier Halloween event in the Orlando region. Now, Halloween Horror Nights is meant to be scary and it's advised for anybody to be 13 years and older. Here you have the park decorated for the scary season. You have 10 themed horror mazes, typically themed to original universal inventions and also some that are based on popular films and TV shows. So you've had the likes of Stranger Things and The Last of Us recently. You also have scare zones throughout the park and shows across the resort too, as well as some limited food offerings and just some really great decorations. So if this is what you're into, we'd say go and check it out. For the Christmas season, you have both parks getting dressed up for the season, as well as special events throughout. Universal Studios will have the Macy's Parade taken to the street, and in Islands of Adventure, you have Grinchmas, with a special holiday show presented by the Grinch. Once again, you have food and drink offerings that are specially made for this occasion. Both the Parade and Grinchmas are free to see, so you don't need a separate ticket to see these events. It is a great addition to the parks at this time of year. Much like Disney, Universal offers a package ticket for Universal Orlando Resort. And this is at a significantly reduced cost compared to what you would pay for purchasing single day tickets from Universal. 
If you plan on going to the resort for more than a couple of days, and trust me, like Universal is really turning into a destination where you want a handful of days, your best bet may be to purchase that two week special ticket. This is dubbed the Universal Orlando Three Park Explorer Ticket. Now at time of recording, this is priced at £345 per adult and slightly cheaper for children. This ticket covers you for 14 days at both Universal theme parks as well as Volcano Bay Water Park. Typically, if you were to purchase single day tickets, this can be up to $100 per person and sometimes even more, dependent on the day. And that's not accounting for park to park access, which is required to ride the Hogwarts Express. Although, if you were only looking for a day or two, single day tickets may be cheaper. If we're looking to purchase single day tickets, we like to use the Universal app to do that, or we use somebody like Undercover Tourist who will be able to offer you ticketing options. However, when we book our two week tickets, we like to use the likes of attractiontickets.com or floridatix.com, as previously mentioned, like we do with our Disney ticketing options. Whilst you're at Universal Orlando Resort, you have a few transportation options on property. As previously mentioned, you have the option to walk from a few resorts to the park. You also have the water taxi options available that can take you from a few resorts to City Walk and the parks. Each resort has a bus service to City Walk too, so you're conveniently located. And as Universal Orlando is much smaller than Walt Disney World, there's less need for transportation on property. Parking at Universal Orlando Resort is $27 per car per day, and this is prior to City Walk. You have to walk through that from the parking garage. If you do arrive after 6 p.m. outside of Halloween Horror Nights, you do get free access to those car parks as they'd like you to visit Universal City Walk. Like Walt Disney World, Universal Orlando is an incredibly inclusive resort with accommodations in place for guests with visible and invisible displays. The process of signing up to Universal's access program is slightly different, however. In order to do this, you will need to register with a third party company and provide proof of your disability. The link for this can be found in the description. The card issued virtually will be the IBCCES Individual Accessibility Card. Once this is issued, Universal Orlando will be in touch to speak to you via the phone and complete registration and explain what accommodations they can put in place for you. In some cases, like Disney, it is a virtual queue of sorts. You'll still have to wait the same time, but virtually. The difference with Universal is you're given a card which you take to the front of each attraction, they'll issue you a return time and then you come back to visit the attraction. You can only have one of these in play at a time. Much like Disney as well, certain disabilities will not be applicable like broken legs and arms and things like that. Uh, Universal Orlando Resort offers you the option to hire wheelchairs and electric convenience vehicles too. But you can also purchase these at the entrance to each park or in the parking structure if you require it a little bit sooner. You do also have the ability to hire these from third party companies in the Orlando area. So let's talk about applications. When you go to Orlando with the two major theme park resorts, you have Walt Disney World and Universal Orlando. And as I mentioned in the section about mobile phones, you're pretty reliant on your mobile nowadays. Uh, so there's two main applications that you'll have. You'll have the Disney one, which is called My Disney Experience, and then you'll have the Universal Orlando Resort app. So what we're going to do is just give you a little bit of a brief overview of what these apps are, how reliant you'll be on them, um, and what you can do in them. So we're going to assume that you've uh, downloaded the app, you've gone into whichever app store that you have, be it the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. You've gone in and you've downloaded the Disney app. That is the My Disney Experience app, and the logo is a little blue logo uh, with the Cinderella castle on it. So we're going to go and open that app now and show you what it looks like. So as the app opens, you're presented with the main home screen. Uh, you see your name. We're doing this on an iPad, so it will look slightly different. This is just to make it a little bit clearer for you. You see uh, your resorts and all of your plans. You've got your park opening times down there, 
um, that show for the day of and you can also click in and you can see the future park dates as well and that will show you the times and the upcoming shows and things like that when you click today's show times. Here you can access your virtual queue for Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind and Tron Light Cycle Run as well. You can see all your resorts and all of your plans like we mentioned um, and then you can also see the actual resorts themselves, the theme parks and here you have all the wait times. Now we're recording this before the parks have opened for the day so you don't see any of the wait times but these will all populate as the day goes by. When you click at the top you've got uh, various categories so you've got your wait times, your attractions, your characters so you can do character meet and greets throughout the park. You can see dining, entertainment, restrooms and things like that. So it's quite a useful app uh, to show you around Walt Disney World. So as we zoom out slightly you'll see the full extent of Walt Disney World and you can see the proximity of the park. So you've got the Magic Kingdom right at the top, you've got Epcot there halfway down, Hollywood Studios just underneath that and then far off to the left you've got Animal Kingdom, you've got Blizzard Beach and Typhoon Lagoon dotted across there as well. And then up to the right you've got Disney Springs. So as you zoom in ever so slightly, you can see all of the hotels and the resorts and uh, where they are in approximate location to the theme parks themselves. Um, but this app is pretty crucial if you do have a Walt Disney World vacation. Uh, this is where you'll book all of your Genie return times, your Genie Plus. Um, you also book your disability access service here. You will book your dining reservations here too. So in order to book a dining reservation, you click the little plus button here at the bottom, and then you click check dining availability. So you obviously just follow the instructions there. You pick your party size, you check the day that you want. So for us now, we're gonna go for the 1st of September, and then we're gonna click lunch and then see what's available. And then what you'll see is you'll see various times pop up in a, in a brief period there over the lunchtime period. And it'll tell you the name of the restaurant, it'll give you the time, it'll tell you where that restaurant is and which land that's located in if it is in a park. And bear in mind if you do book a dining reservation in a park you will be required to have ticketed access to the park for that day. You can't just go in and... Um, go in for the dining reservation. It has to be for a park day and then you can have your dining reservation. Uh, you do also have restaurants located at all of the resorts. You have quick service, you have table service, you have grab and go, things like that. Um, going back out of that, you can also press back in and you can order food. Now that will be a mobile order of food. So some of the quick service locations, you can order food and then come up to a window to collect it. It's a very simple process and sometimes it can be a lot quicker to do that than it can be to just go and stand in the queue and wait at the window. You can book it, you come back for a time. If we're booking at half 12 in the afternoon, we can select a time for say one o'clock, tell them that we're there and our food will be ready a few minutes after that. So it's quite useful. Here in the bottom corner, you see this little hamburger menu. Um, this will give you kind of the menu of everything that you have. So you've got tickets are located in here. You've got Magic Mobile. Now Magic Mobile is the way that you can access the park without your ticket. You can register your Apple Watch or your iPhone or your Android phone or whatever to be your park ticket and you can use that to access the turnstiles. Uh, you do also have Magic Bands. Now that's something I wanted to touch on a little bit as well. So it You've got your Magic Band, so you've got your Magic Band and your Magic Band Plus. Now, Magic Band itself is a strap that goes on your wrist, much like a watch, and that'll give you access to the theme parks. You can touch in for your Genie reservations, you can grab your photo passes from photographers around, um, but it will also automatically link some photos to your account through that magic band. Now they are non-transferable so you can't go and buy used ones off eBay or anything like that but you can buy them at various locations throughout the resort be it at your hotel, in the parks or at Disney Springs you'll have 
tons of options available and then you just link them to your My Disney Experience app from there. You also have the option for Magic Band Plus. Now, the first Magic Band has a battery included in it that is non-rechargeable. So when that reaches the end of life, it will last around two years for some of that stuff. And then you'll be able to use it for an extended period of time to access the parks, but you won't get some of that automatic link in just due to the battery drain and things. Um, Magic Band Plus is a similar version, but it's rechargeable, it lights up and things like that. So it is a little bit more expensive. There is generally about $10, $15 difference there in price. So just bear that in mind. Um, but when it comes to Magic Bands, they aren't a requirement. You can get by without having them, be it using a card ticket or using your mobile phone or Apple Watch or something like that. So that's kind of the My Disney Experience app and Magic Bands. My Disney Experience is pretty much a requirement. You do need that application, at least one person in your party, to use it because it's so important. All your ride times are on there. You've got apps, you've got maps, and you check into all the locations using that. So uh, just think about that when you are booking your vacation. So the other application is the Universal Orlando Resort. And once again, we're going to assume that you've got this application as well. Universal Orlando, you search it, it'll be the Universal logo with Universal Orlando Resort on it, saying Universal Florida. So as we click into the application, it's not as essential as Disney and it's not as complicated as Disney. So you're presented with this home screen that'll give you this scrolling banner across the top. And you can see sort of various little things that they want you to see up front. You can buy your tickets here, but this is single day tickets. Remember what we said there about the two week tickets that you have available. You really want to look at those two week tickets if you're there for more than a couple of days. You can see the park hours, you can see the map, you can see rides, shows and dining. So let's click into the map. Uh, and it's not as jazzy as the Walt Disney World one, um, but you can see all of the rides. So you've got the two parks here, you've got Universal Studios Florida to the right hand side there, you've got Universal Islands of Adventure there, and then just off to the side here you have Volcano Bay as well. And then you can see the resorts there, you can change the category of the ride dependent on which you want, and that'll just filter them away take away some of the water rides, 3D rides, thrill rides, things like that. So you can you can go through it that way and then you can also change it so it's more of a list view as well. So you've got quite a, you've got quite a good application there. You can, uh, once again, you can buy the tickets in here if you just want the day tickets. You've got Express Pass and you've got Extras as well. You do have your tickets in this area as well. I'm not signed into this application so we can't see too much in there but you've got your wallet and that'll be where you store you can store your tickets in there, but you can also store a payment method for, for if you want to do mobile dining, much like you can at Disney. There's just a few less locations at Universal. They're not as advanced in the mobile dining department as Disney is. Um, but that's a good, you know, we've got both of these applications. The Universal one isn't as essential as Disney, though we do recommend keeping it to hand anyway. So do download both of those applications if you're going to Walt Disney World and Universal Orlando. You have another theme park located in the Orlando area, and that is SeaWorld Orlando. Now SeaWorld Orlando dubs themselves the coaster capital of Orlando. Now SeaWorld is definitely a thrill seekers park with huge roller coasters located throughout the park. You have the likes of Mako, which is often praised as one of the best roller coasters in Orlando. You have their newest roller coaster. Now this is Pipeline. This is a stand-in roller coaster themed to surfing. You have Infinity Falls, which is a river raft attraction that you get very wet on. It's perfect for cooling off in the Florida heat. Uh, here at SeaWorld, you also have Sesame Street Land, and this is a very cute themed area dedicated to children and gives them something great to do in the parks with cute smaller rides and splash pads. Now, SeaWorld also has a number of marine life shows and exhibits. Now, I won't comment on the park or their practices, but if you love roller coasters, now SeaWorld is a great place to go. 
SeaWorld doesn't have any of their hotels or anything like that, so you will need to source your accommodation from somewhere else. Uh, but it's somewhere, if you have a couple of weeks or a few weeks on Orlando, it's a nice park to visit. Located outside Orlando, but often visited by Orlando tourists, is Busch Gardens Tampa. Owned also by SeaWorld too, it's located around an hour from Orlando. Much like SeaWorld, it's very much a thrill seekers park. Here you'll find huge roller coasters and thrill rides, including the newly opened Iron Guazi. This is one of the biggest roller coasters going, it's made up of wood and steel and it looks like a beast. You also have Cheetah Hunt, a triple launch roller coaster, as well as Sheikra, which features a 200 foot straight down drop. Now, the park also has zoo elements throughout with animals nestled in amongst the park. Once again, if you are a thrill seeker, this is certainly the place to be. Both SeaWorld and Busch Gardens have single day tickets available on their website, and they also offer combo tickets where you can visit both parks within a set period. As with Disney and Universal, you can buy two-week tickets from ticket outlets like attractiontickets.com or floridatix.com. These are very cheap compared to other parks at about £160 or something. So bear in mind when you're thinking of visiting for a day or so, you may want to get that two-week ticket. You also have Aquatica included, which is a water park located close to SeaWorld Orlando. I wanted to touch on food, food and drink around Orlando and Florida and what that is like for a guest visiting from the UK. Now, typically over in the UK, we see the likes of chicken nuggets and chips, hot dogs, and things like that in the parks, particularly in, in the Merlin parks with Legoland, Alton Towers, Thorpe Park, and Chessington. You know, you can't walk around Legoland without seeing somewhere to buy one of those rollover hot dogs. And when you go to Walt Disney World or when you go to Universal, you do still have those options available. So if you are a little bit more of a picky eater, you do have options available for you. You've got the hot dogs, you've got chicken nuggets, you've got chips, you've got hamburgers, things like that, you know, some of those options are available. And then outside the park, you do have the likes of McDonald's, KFC as well. So you aren't going to go hungry in any way, shape or form. One of the interesting things that you will have though at Walt Disney World and Universal Orlando are a lot more variety in terms of restaurants and quick service options available. Um, so take the likes of the Magic Kingdom, for instance, you've got something like Be Our Guest. Now, this is a very immersively themed sit-down restaurant themed to Beauty and the Beast. And that's a proper sit-down, three-course meal that you can have. You can also have something at Cinderella's Royal Table. And that's a restaurant in the castle where you do character meet and greets with princesses, uh, whilst you then sit and have your three-course meal as well. You will also find snack carts dotted all around the park so you can get things like popcorn you can get ice cream and all that kind of stuff at all different locations throughout the parks when it then comes to disney springs you've got a whole host of locations down there um, with quick service restaurants you've got table service restaurants you've got grab and go little food trucks and things like that and you've got walk up options available too uh, so there are a whole host of options available that cover all palettes all cuisines there's no way, shape or form that you're gonna go hungry at all. As we mentioned as well, at Epcot, you've got little food booths located all around the park. You have, particularly in the festival times as well, you've got these little food booths that are themed to certain countries. So you have China, you have Japan, you have Australia, things like that. And you have little dishes that are taster size portions that are geared towards those cuisines. So there's such a variety of food. If you are a picky eater, you've got those options available. Uh, if you're a little bit more flexible in your palate, you've got those available as well. There really is something for everybody. And in the applications, you can see the menu for each of the food locations as well. So you can have a look at those before you make your decision. What we would suggest, if you are a little bit more of a picky eater, 
do have a look at the application beforehand and then you can have a look and see what it is that you may like to try when you visit those locations. And you can make yourself a little list, that's what we like to do, of little snacks that we have around. There's also a Starbucks located in all of the theme parks as well, so you've got your typical coffees that you can have to get you through those long park days. When it comes to Universal, it's much in the same. You do have the grab and go options, you have quick service available, you've got cafes and you have table service restaurants. Now with Universal being a little bit of a smaller resort, there aren't as many options, but they've still got variety there available. You've got both of those parks that serve a whole host of options. You've got somewhere like Burger Digs in Jurassic Park, which will serve you your burgers, your chips, your chicken nuggets, things like that. Um, but then you've got another option somewhere like Mythos, which will give you a little bit more of a varied palette. You're, that's more geared to like Middle Eastern cuisines and things like that, particularly the Lost Continent area. Um, over in Universal Studios Florida, you've then got places like the Today Cafe where you'll be able to get just sandwiches, you'll get salads and the likes. Um, over in Diagon Alley, you've got some typical uh, pub grub food if you want some of that British cuisine as well. So you really do have options all across those two parks. Uh, and then you of course have Universal City Walk as well, which will have a bunch of restaurants. You've got the Hard Rock Cafe, you've got Toothsome's Chocolate Emporium, uh, you've got Bubba Gump's Shrimp Restaurant. You've got loads of options available for you dependent on what you feel like for the day and what your palette looks like. And then as mentioned, when it comes to off-site, you have a whole host of options, the likes that you'll see over here, but then you also have a bunch of table service restaurants. So if you have the option to get off-site, off of uh, Universal property, off of Disney property, you do have restaurants available to match any cuisine that you may like. So we know that has been a lot of information to take in, but hopefully it's kind of given you an idea of how to plan your Orlando vacation. There is so much that goes into it and we know it's a really big expenditure and something that every member of the family is going to cherish those memories for years to come. So you do want to make it right. We know how stressful it can be. If there are any further questions that are really racking your brain, do feel free to put a comment down at the bottom and we'll try and answer them to the best of our ability. Like we said, we are heading to Orlando very soon as well. So we will have a series up covering Disney, Universal, as well as Busch Garden, and some of those hotels in and around the area. So be sure to stick around for that and keep an eye out so you can really get a sense and a feel for what everything is like over in Orlando. So thank you very much for watching if you've got this far and hopefully you have enjoyed the video throughout. If you have, it'd be great if you could give us a thumbs up because it really will help more people see this video. And if you could hit the subscribe button, the bell icon to be notified when we post all new videos, that'll be great. We'll see you on the other side. Thanks.